You're listening to Atlanta Baseball Talk, your weekly podcast for all things Atlanta Braves. Welcome to show number 273. Today is Sunday, August 3rd, 2014, and my name is Steve. I am joined by my co-hosts, Hammy and Kurt. And let's get to it, guys. So in tonight's show, we'll talk about the rough, rough West Coast road trip. The moves at the trade deadline and Miners continued struggles. But first, guys, beloved Braves announcer Pete Van Weeren died this weekend. Guys, Pete and Skip were such a big part of the Braves fabric for so many years, and now they're both gone. This is really a tough one. I mean, Hammy, it's... (laughs) Yeah, and I mean, you know, for me, it's momentous because I would throw Ernie Johnson Sr. in there as well as sort of the voice, um, you know, and for my money... Um, you know, you think of Vince Scully as sort of this lone great announcer and others, but as a team, those three were, ever since I could remember knowing the Braves, those were the Braves up until recently, right? And their voices. And um, it's sad because now all three of them are gone. And for, um, you know, it, it was just, he was such a pivotal role in that. It's how I understood baseball. It's how I came to love baseball. And you had Skip, who was the sort of sarcastic retorter. And, um, you know, deadpan guy, you had steady Eddie Ernie just keeping things moving. And then you had Pete, who really added the context and the depth to the conversation. He knew so much about each player, about each team, about the history of the game. And he was able to wrap it in in a very relevant and not condescending, know-it-all kind of way. And it was great. And and you don't realize how essential that is. I feel like I was spoiled. I don't realize how essential that was or how great that was to a good experience of baseball until you it's gone. Uh, and he will be missed. He was one of a kind. Curtis, what do you think? Yeah, he was great, and he I, he was always my favorite of the three. I mean, uh, I just liked his his demeanor. He had a great voice uh, on top of anything, and I think that something that's lost now that that they had for so many years was that those guys would rotate between TV and radio. So um, now, obviously, it's it's um, Chip and and Joe do the TV, and Don and Jim Powell do the radio, and so if you can't get one of those um, in some part of the country, then you never get to hear those guys call a game. Um, And so, of course, when back when those three were part of it and whoever else was there, uh, Joe Simpson obviously was there for a long time, John Sterling, all sorts of guys that came through. Um, But they would rotate. So you always got to hear, whether you were on the radio or on the TV, you always got to hear all of those guys calling the game. And, of course, we know so many memorable calls from um, Skip's carry because it was probably set up where he would get to call the ninth. But, you know, Pete Van Weeren was just so good, so so um, intelligent about the game, really loved the game. And I, I can't imagine what it was like to, to call those games in the 80s. Um, but keep it um, entertaining and keep it informative despite your team winning you know, 70 games a season or something like that. So, yeah, it really gets kind of like the end of the 80s, that kind of woebegone time um, for so many Braves fans where now you look back and you're like, yo, everybody remember how terrible they were. It's really kind of the last vestige of all of that era is totally gone now. And it was so smart of the Braves once Pete retired from the booth to use him as the MC of the organization whenever they retired a number uh, you know a player's number or had some sort of big event on the field it was always Pete so you still had that connection back to that booth like you're saying Kurt and now that really is all gone really a sad sad weekend for the Braves in that way yeah and it was great that they got sorry last point but it was great that they all all of those guys got to see winning happen that they stuck it with it for so long with this team. And I don't think they're appreciated nationally. I mean, considering that the Braves were a national team for so long, I don't think that any of those guys get the, get the consideration that they should as, I, as baseball announcers. I don't know. I would I think they got more, maybe not. They got more notoriety and, and recognition than in, I think maybe any other announcer team, you know, I mean, they Just played because the soap of TBS and because of TBS because of Turner. Turner. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, they, they might get it. They might have gotten exposure, but I don't know that they've got appreciation. Fair enough. Well, all right, guys, it's not life or death, but this road trip 
six games in is certainly ugly. So after beating the Padres Monday in Atlanta, which seems like a lifetime ago, uh, the eight-game West Coast trip began six games in. The Braves have yet to win a game, swept by both the Dodgers and the Padres. So, Hammy, does this week change your opinion about this team and their potential for this year? Uh, it it does. I mean, it does both on on the field and off the field. Uh, you know, I think we'll talk about the trade in a little bit. Um, but on the field, we were horrible. We lost on every level. We were bad against good teams and and bad against bad teams. Um, and I don't think you know. Freddie said in the news the in his recap last night or today that we're just in a bad slump right now. We really needed a running, you know, a hit with runners in scoring position. We're just slumping. And and slumping means that there's another side of you that's generally better than this and should be better than this on a more consistent basis and you're just going through a bad thing. And I think this is a very even component of who the Braves are, the ability to play like this. And, and I mean, there may be a little bit of snowballing going on here, but, I mean, the starting pitching is unreliable. The, the closers are unreliable. The offense is unreliable. We're, we're making mistakes in the field. And we're not, I mean, we're not horrible every single play, but um, we needed someone to step up this week and, and win a game for us, and we do not have that, and that did not happen. So I don't think... And it just maybe I think it was a it hammered it home for me that this is the team that's going to, you know if we were to make it to the postseason which I don't think we will we would get we could slot in the postseason as well we're just not at that next level yet. So Curtis, it's just one week, but I know that to me it feels like something changed this week and that you know, the 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 train is off the tracks in a way that we haven't seen all season, even worse than like that Red Sox series. What, what do you think? Yeah, I uh, I'm as low on the Braves as I've been in a long time. I am literally at a zero in every facet of um, my meters, my expectations for the rest of the season, not only for the division but for the playoffs. If this team got into the playoffs, they would have no shot against anybody. Um, and I am honestly really struggling with the fact that this is the core going forward. Um, they have that the, the manager, I have serious, serious doubts about, um, frankly, the, the front office, I have serious doubts about. Um, and I know that they've won some games. They've won a lot of games. They put themselves in the postseason and things like that, but they have clearly apex. This is, this is a backslide. Um, I know they've lost some pitchers, but I, frankly, if you had Chris Medlin, if you had Bra- uh, Brandon Beachy, um, I don't know how much better this team would be. Uh, you know, they would have they would have the same offensive problems. They would still be losing games where their their starting pitchers pitched well. Um, and, you know, and now you're locked into this core because they gave so many of these guys extensions, except one of the most vital pieces of the the component which is Hayward and wh- where do we go with this team uh you know it, it, it are is it, is it is it feasible that we've locked into a product now that frankly isn't isn't really constructed to be a good baseball team well i don't know about that i mean let, let, let's go back to the to the Dodgers series right the Dodgers series the Dodgers may be the best team in the national league and we played them pretty tough. Aside from Varvaro giving up those three runs in the first game, you know, Tehran pitched a great game. Wood pitched a great game. We went up against Granke and Kershaw. Like, that wasn't a bad series. Clearly not the results that we wanted. The minor is really struggling. That The team gave up that night. I mean, that Friday in San Diego was horrendous. Really just no excuse they look. They just stop playing the game um, against a guy who has thirteen losses on the season. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Now you know, Ham. You you said we we lost against good teams. We lost against bad teams. You know the the Padres. I think are number one in the NL in ERA. All of a sudden, like out of nowhere, and have scored the most runs in July. Like the Padres have figured some stuff out. I'm not saying we shouldn't have won. We should have yeah. won. Yeah, we should have won two of those games easy. I, I uh, just I, so I think about um, you know we were sending around earlier that Dob quote about lack of leadership here and this like I, like I was saying a bit earlier we needed someone there were a lot of opportunities for someone to step up and win the game 
to put the team on their back. Now, we had people keep us in the game, you know, but we had a lot of opportunities to win these games against, and the pod, whoever, whatever the level of play, we were there, and no one stepped up and did it. We don't, that's the flaw of this team, and that's why I don't have faith in this team. You know, they, they, they will, they'll win some games. They have talent. They'll, they'll get hot and go on a, str- a stretch. And we still have good hitters. But I think we lack the, 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 the structure. Like, we don't have Chipper. We don't have McCann. You know, I think Medlin being hurt is not as much of a presence. We have no leaders on this team. And you need that to get through these hard times, right? To, to, to sort of turn the tide when you're going through a bad stretch, when you have a game like Friday night. And I just I, – I don't think we have that, and I don't think we will this season. The team is you – know, we are 112 games into the season now. And we've talked about over this past month, well, maybe the run is coming, and we've been doing this for a long time, and things change. And I, like, I'm ready to believe now that the offense will not find consistency. Uh, I, you know, we go down two runs today, and – I don't believe anymore that that we can really come back from those games because the offense has no consistency. And we'll get to the the trade deadline in a minute, but the bullpen is really really thin and it seems to get thinner every day. And then the, you know, Simmons's rogue bunt Saturday night and not being at his locker, DOB tweeting about he sees no leadership in the clubhouse. I mean, this is the this is the the stuff that was sort of out there looming about such a young team and facing adversity like this. And no one is like, you know, where's the team only meeting where, you know, someone needs to be knocking stuff off the off tables right now and throwing chairs around like it's time. It is time for that. And maybe maybe that happens tonight after this game, because what a brutal, brutal weekend in San Diego. Just just brutal. Well, it's just yeah, just to play as poorly, and and I I look, I'm not trying to backtrack on anything. I'm not suggesting there's not talent on this team. I'm not suggesting that this team could not win and could could go forth and do great things. But the way this team plays and the way this team acts, the way this team seems to handle their business, it, you know, that you you start off at 17 and seven, you've now gone 41 and 47. So. It's hard to believe that there's something different than what you see as a 41 and 47 team because that's what it is. That's what you continue to see out of this team is is it, it, they are consistent. They are consistently mediocre. Um, and they're it's consistently just, below 500 is what yeah. they are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mediocre would uh, <laughs> yeah, would would give us a different win total this season. So speaking of. Kurt, there's 50 games left. The Braves are 58 and 54. How many games do they win this season? I say 86, which seems optimistic, but that that knocks them out of the playoffs by, I think they'll probably finish six or seven games behind the, the Nationals. Hammy, how about you? Uh, I'm I'm less optimistic. I think they go 500, which which even that feels maybe optimistic. Uh, they win 25 games and finish... Uh, with 83 wins. Yeah, I, I don't see why we're going to go 500. For one thing, we, we just finished a long stretch of games against teams under 500. We're now starting a stretch of, I think, 19 games against teams over 500. So I say the Braves will go 23 and 27 the rest of the season and finish with 81 wins. So continuing down this which Very might even positive which track. might have even put them in third place in the division. Yeah, no, the the Marlins could pass us for sure. Um, Ham, do you think there's any way Freddie is not the manager next season? No, no, I don't think his job would have been in jeopardy for next season anyway. But once Medlin, well, he and got Beachy, the extension, of course. This right. this in February. Yeah, but but once once Meech, once Medlin and Beach, regardless of the situation heading this season, once Medlin and Beachy went down at the beginning of the season, I think I think he got a, a bit of a free pass, uh, right or wrong, deserve it or not. Um, and I don't think it's just Freddie who's the problem. But I don't think his job is in jeopardy for next season. I would be shocked if if he was not here next season. Curtis, how about you? 
Yeah, same. Um, but I, there's definitely uh, I, the leadership issues that you talked about. They go beyond just players. Um, you know, him talking about the Simmons situation and and that oh, he's going to have to go. I mean, wh- that stuff should be ingrained. I know these guys are young, um, but you know, I mean, you're now zero and nine in your last. <laughs> nine one run games and that seems to me that starts from the top i he he won't be fired but i i think that 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 would be the primary spot i would begin with if i wanted to get this team turned around yeah i think that it's a possibility but a lot of bad stuff's going to happen i think not breaking 80 wins plus more scenarios like we saw this weekend with simmons knopping at his locker after the game more stories about losing the clubhouse I think that he could be out. I really do. But again, a lot of there, you know, it would have to be a real um, perfect storm of bad events down the stretch for them to consider because it is not the Braves way. All right, guys. So the trade deadline came and went this week and the Braves have two new team members, lefty reliever James Russell and switch hitting utility man Emilio Bonifacio. So, Kurt, do you think that these trades make the team better? I think they'd make the team better uh, because those were two needs that you had. Uh, if you were to look at some of the needs that the Braves had, they needed a lefty reliever and they needed a versatile guy who was much better than what they had on the bench currently. So, yes, they were able to check two of those things off for a single-A catcher. Um, and, yeah, so it makes your team better, but it, uh, as I've stated over and over again, it does not it come anywhere close to solving all the ills that the Braves have currently. Um, but yes, I just on paper, it makes them marginally better. Hammy, how about you? Well, I mean, it does, obviously. I mean, like what Kurt said, you know, if you're giving up Caratini, who at this point is a is has more value as a trading chip than as a player in the ultimate picture of the system, and with Gaddis and, and Betancourt and Laird, obviously he's you know he has a, a list in front of them. So that's great, and we needed a lefty in the pen, albeit that Russell is better against uh, righties than lefties, but that's all right. Uh, and you know Bonifacio is is absolutely an upgrade of the the Dumit, Pena, Pastor Nicky, Schaefer, Poo Poo Platter. So that was great. Our team is technically better now than they were before the trade, but. And to Kurt's point a little bit, you know, what I'm disappointed by is it, it indicates one of two things to us. A, it just speaks to the level of the Braves' commitment or ability to go after a big, to go after a, a, a Price or a Lester or, 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 or Cespedes even, you know, so even someone on the other side of those trades. Um, so the, the ability to, or it, or the, you know, the desire to, or it speaks to the fact that they think we're good enough and that this is that there's some disillusionment there thinking that if we do this trade, this is what's going to take us to that next level and, and, and give us success in the postseason. And so it was disappointing on, on a lot of levels, regardless of the case. Yeah, I think it's the question of commitment versus ability is an important one. I don't doubt that Frank and Freddie and the front office are committed to winning. It's the budget. It's it's Liberty Mutual, right? Uh, I'm sorry, Liberty Mutual. It's, 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 <laughs> I wish. It's, it's Liberty Media. Mm-hmm. Um, I firmly believe that, uh, particularly after the Santana signing, when they blew their self-imposed budget, that they were told, you have no more money. This is all we're giving you. Do the best you can. And I think that Frank did the best he can. I mean, I think they gave up essentially nothing to get these two guys that make the team better. Now, I don't think it's going to really move the needle, particularly on this team. But I, I don't know that it speaks to like a lack of commitment, other than if you're talking about the suits at Liberty Media. Mm. Well, right. but you saw these other moves that these these other contenders were making, and they far superseded uh, anything, obviously, that the Braves were going to even attempt and put those teams on levels that the Braves had no chance of competing with. So, I mean, these teams got these, well, a lot of these teams got so much better and they were already better than the Braves. So, you know, it is, it, it, I, I don't doubt that they, they would do anything they could to make this team more competitive, which I think they think they did. But um, it, yeah, I mean, the, the continued issues with the payroll and all that kind of stuff, I mean, 
it that that whole issue makes me feel like you're not a hundred percent into it that if you have to say this is where I'm at and this is all the money I'm going to spend, then the things happen. You know, I mean, you have to you have to account for stuff, and so the Braves have to spend more money this year to make themselves better. And now they've reached a point where they're like, yeah, well, that's that's where we're at. So, yeah, I think it just speaks to corporate ownership to sure. this corporate ownership anyway. Right. Yep. So, guys, two corresponding moves uh, to uh, make room for our the new teammates. We're sending Shreve back down and DFAing Jordan Schaefer, who was picked up by the Twins this weekend, by the way. So, uh, you know, any heartburn and, about Schaefer being sent down? Would you have rather, you know, sent Goslin back down or gotten rid of Pena or anything like that? Uh, Hammy? Uh, and a quick uh, tip of the cap to Dan Ugla, who got released from the uh, Giants after a very inauspicious couple games. Um, all the errors. I mean, like, I... Uh, I know this will yeah. be very popular, but I felt bad for Ugla because that's just that's just awful. I felt bad for him too. I felt bad for him too. Yeah, I didn't get the people that were actively rooting for his failure out there. I, I just I don't get that. I mean, yeah, I don't get it either. What, what, it wasn't what for benefit, lack of trying here, right? And, and yeah. what benefit does it does it give you to to hope that that guy fails somewhere else? I mean, yeah. Uh, and I would say that you know I'd say the same thing for Schaefer. I hope that he. I wish him well. I, I think that. You know, he complained about not really getting a chance, and it's fair, but not that's not that because Freddie was wrong. There's there's better players than him on the roster and less at bats to go around, so he didn't get a chance to play consistently, and he had flashes. So I wish him well, but it was the right move. Uh, yeah, you know. I mean, you know, his batting average in on base this year was one sixty three, two fifty six, but you go back to the first of August last year after he had that like torrid run, and then broke his foot. He came back those last two months and hit 170 and on base 248. Yeah. So this is not new for Schaefer. All right, guys, a couple quick announcements. So um, all of our new shows are available on our YouTube channel, which you can find by searching Atlanta Baseball Talk out on YouTube. So please do that and subscribe to the channel. Um, and also we have a new Facebook fan page. Go out there and like us. It is at facebook.com slash Atlanta Baseball Talk. All right, so guys, let's play fair or foul, where I throw something out there. You agree with it fair or disagree with it foul? So we all three last week said that we should stay the course with Miner. There's really no other option. Got to keep throwing him out there. And then he got knocked around by the Padres this weekend for five runs and maybe looked as bad as he has all year doing it. So after the game, the Braves announced that they are skipping Miner's next start. No one gets a spot start because there's so many days off this week. They can do it. So fair or foul? Kurt, is this the right move? Fair, 100%. I, I know. <laughs> it, seems, it seems a long time ago, and, one, and it really was one start. But <laughs> it, it's, it's just this trend. 12 homers, last 10 starts. His, 10, his last 10 starts, his ERA is 7.33. Opponent's batting average is 357. Mm. I, it's, I would... Even He's beyond that, no one. yeah, they yeah, should and send just, it. And leaving pitches just fat over the plate. I yeah. mean, it's just ugly. They should send him down. They should send him to AAA and and see if he can figure something out. Yeah. Hammy, how about you? I mean, you know, and actually last week I said the only, I think their only recourse, as long as he's on the roster, is to is to give is skip a start and then throw him out there and hope that he you know picks something up. So I think fair you know you skip a start but you don't have any other options you didn't upgrade you didn't get lester or price or anybody to to help this team not that they would have so he's out there he is one of our starting pitchers i don't think we have a ton of better options out there potentially um i think you have to keep throwing him out there and hope if he can get a day off and miss a start for him that you're in and miss a seven run game then you're lucky yeah i mean he really has looked as bad uh, this past week as he had all season. And, you know, the quotes and the body language, it's all, if I could figure out how to make it better, I would, is really the energy and the words that you're getting from him now, which is really not what you want to be hearing from one of your starting pitchers and a foundation of your of your pitching rotation going forward. I mean, I think that the skip a couple starts and see if he can just work with Roger and figure something out is the way to go before you really push the panic button and send him down. Because how screwed up is David Hale now, right? With the with that awful week, um, you know, earlier when we had that Red Sox series and the 
all the runs he gave up in extra innings, then the extra innings run he gave up in L.A. this week, him and giving today. up the – and then today. I mean, his head's got to be all screwed up too. It's uh, it's a little ugly. The back end of the rotation is getting a little – See, but that's, but that's where, it, you know, it would have been interesting, I think, to, to if the Braves are really committed to winning, they could have gotten creative. It's not just about money, but why not move minor? Why not see if there's someone who's willing to take a chance on minor and use him as a trade ship, as a package, um, and, and fix this? But I think it's – Who's taking it, minor right now, though, Hammy? I think and and get, getting anything good for him. I, I just, I mean, I hear you, but I, I don't see that. I mean, Miner's been awful back to last year. It's not even just this year. Yeah, I don't know, but I think he's still got promise. I mean, well, hopefully, I think it's he's for still us. got promise too. He was amazing before things sort of started going off the rails last year. And he got injured. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, he got injured in the off season. I, I don't know how much that has to do with this now. He says it has nothing to do with it anyway. Yeah, you wonder if there was any sort of uh, creativity that that. The Wren was trying to put together in a trade, or if they just were not even going to go down that road. I mean, I, I wonder if Hayward was offered, or I'm sure they were offering BJ to who anybody would take him. I, I cannot believe that they were not trying to get rid of BJ Upton. Look, um, when a guy's urethra gets operated on the off season, he's damaged goods. It's true. All Whoa. right, guys, let's play. Uh, let's play. Guess the stats. So, not counting today's game, where he went over five, <laughs> which was horrendous. Yes. Um, Guess BJ's batting average and on base his last 20 games in the one hole. So, Ham, what do you got? 245, 270. All right, Kurt? 180, 240. Well, it's kind of right in the middle. So he's been batting 225 with an on base of 319. I was closer. Yeah, you were a little closer. Um, <laughs> but clearly it's, it's, it's not really helping the, uh, the offense produce, I think is fair it, to say. Isn't it, fu- it's, what's funny is that like, it's, it's almost like Stockholm syndrome or something. And maybe that's not it, but that, that we were held hostage by BJ's like horrible, 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 horrible average forever that when he got when he just got in the lead off i remember he was at like 200 201 and he's actually moved it up to like 216 i think yeah, or 217 like, he was like hitting 250 in the one hole for a while and everyone's right. like oh my god but it's amazing what you'll take when you know what the alternative is well like, i think i think that we are the three of us are guilty of that somewhat all season we haven't focused that that much on the offense because we're so resigned to it you know, so we have focused on the bullpen and we focused on when starting pitching was failing and picking on BJ and picking on Ugla. But yeah, it's we, we have Stockholm Syndrome with this whole offense. You mean yeah. like them having bases loaded with nobody out in back-to-back games and not scoring one run? You mean that type of offense? That, that kind of impossible stuff happening two days yeah. in a row? It just it just be, it beats you down that when you get you go on a stretch of twenty games where he's hitting two thirty five and three nineteen OBP, you're like that's awesome. Yeah, that's that's great. BJ's a BJ's he's beating a, expectations. He's a real contributor. <laughs> <laughs> so so guys, we, we have said repeatedly, there's no way Freddie's moving him out of the one spot, particularly after his complaining when he was down in the seven and all that. But Ham, do you think that he starts getting platooned? in the one spot as well as, um, you know, in the outfield with Bonifacio or at least just in the lineup, say, with Listella. Does, does any of that start happening? I think it does. I think it has to. We, we are in dire need of a shakeup. I think, I think Freddie uh, G, not Freeman, uh, amidst all his foibles, will shake things up a little bit from time to time. So I, I think he's excited to have Bonifacio as, as, as a chip um, you know, maybe he'll put him out there against a lefty, um, take his chances. So I think it's going to happen, and I think it has to happen. Yeah, the lineup has got to, and I predict will look somewhat different on Tuesday in Seattle. I mean, he's just got to. <laughs> when they get King Felix, and it's not going to make one iota about of that. difference. Yeah. Two How hits. How about it? All right, Kurt, do you think they start platooning BJ in the one? I think they have to. I, I'm with you guys. They they have to do something different. It, it it's, but. Uh, 
I, it's just so frustrating. I, 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 maybe we haven't focused on the offense all year long because it makes you want to put a fork in your eye. So, um, yeah, I, they've got to do something again. It's time. It's past time. Um, you know, just bench some guys. Yeah. It, it, if only our bench wasn't so weak. Good point. Uh, All right, guys, time for Shot in the Dark, our prediction for the coming week. But let's check back on last week and see who won the month of July. All right, so, Kurt, yeah, I know. You predicted Freeman would hit 310, two homers, three doubles this week. He went 269, one homer, one double. Hammy, you, uh, you went outside the confines of the team and predicted that Puig would hit over 300 with two homers against us in the Dodgers series. He hit a pedestrian 583 with one <laughs> but, homer. But only one homer. Only one homer, although there were two doubles and a triple in there. I predicted that Kimbrel would notch two four-out saves this week, which became harder when they didn't win any games. <laughs> Did you predict that he would pitch two innings and lose a game by know, walking the bases that? loaded? So I'm going to give it to Hammy this week. Oh, so Hammy and Kurt tie oh, yes. in the month of July. We are on to August with a clean slate. But Uh, before we get there, let's check in on our listener-submitted Shots in the Dark for the past week. So our pastime blog out on Twitter predicted that Tehran would beat Kershaw, but that Kershaw would have more strikeouts. They actually both had nine strikeouts, but of course we know how that game went. And Tehran did look good, to be fair. Tehran looked great and would look great. Yeah. My God. You know, I mean, like I said, the Dodgers series was was not bad. It was really not a bad series. Um, all right, but, so but, Taylor... But, but you lost all those games. Well, yeah, we, we relatively... Had to, we had to win. Losing one. six straight. Those you two have to Blowing that first game was the... That was the killer. I mean, if anyone thought we were winning the next two games after blowing that first game. Yeah, and Beckett got lit up today. Yeah, I, yeah by the Cubs, no less. All right, so uh, Taylor Noxon... I'm sure I butchered your name. My apologies. Out on Twitter, he predicted the Braves would score 20 runs during the Dodgers series and knock Kershaw out of the game. And I'm pretty sure none of those things happened either. (laughs) What did did Meg Lepore submit this week? (laughs) Uh, Seven runs for the series and Kershaw only threw a complete game. All right. So we are asking for your shots in the dark. We'll pick our favorite one. We'll track it for the week and discuss it on the show. So submit them by Twitter or on Facebook. Use the hashtag ABTSITD. You've got until Tuesday to submit them because there's an off day on Monday. Uh, So get those in. All right, so guys, your shots in the dark for this week. Curtis. Uh, Hayward, swinging hot bat. 310, four doubles. All right, Hammy. Playing every game. (laughs) Yes. All right. That's not part of it. You're not held to that. It is now. No, I, called, just, I called bank. <laughs> I'm just wondering if you guys think that will happen. Uh, me, Justin, J up, two homers, 290 average. All right. I'm going to say that BJ does not bat lead off at all this week. That is Freddie's a crazy shot. Freddie's moving him out. It's That's happening. That's the craziest shot in the dark. It's happening. Which is, which is going to be over come Tuesday. Yeah. At least, we'll know, at least you'll be able to sleep knowing you're really, out. Do you guys receiving. think he's batting lead off on Tuesday? I do. I do. Wow. Okay. But who do we, well, let's get to that. Let's, I want to come back to this. Who's starting? Who are we starting against on, on Tuesday? Is it King Felix? It is King Felix. Then, and he's a righty, right? I think he is. Yes. Then it, it'll be BJ. Yeah, it's going to be LaStella. Okay. All right. So let's look at the week ahead. Five games only this week, two in Seattle, and then back home for three against Washington, who now lead us by three and a half in the East. So let's look at the pitching matchups. Wood. Felix Hernandez and his 2.01 ERA, followed by Tehran and Chris Young, who we saw for many years with the Padres, with the Mets for a little while, uh, his 3.19 ERA. And then on to the National Series, Santana Strasburg, who's rocking a 3.39. Harang Roark with his 2.74 ERA, who's just been dominating this whole month. And then Wood, Gio Gonzalez, whose ERA is at 3.88, and he got knocked around by Philly this week for five runs. So, guys, nothing gets easier this week. Like I said, it's a start of, I think, 19 games against teams with above 500 records. What's your prediction for the week, Hammy? I think we go three and two. Uh, I think we go one and one, two and one. I think, 
you know, we still have a little bit of mojo on the on the Nationals. It's at home. Uh, so I think it's going to just a little breathe a little bit of life into the team, and then we're going to get the door slammed in our face in coming weeks. Well, just because we have like the Dodgers and the A's, and I just the see Pirates this as, and the Rams yeah, coming. I see this being it's really as a, week, a tough month. My I goodness. see this being as a week where we win the series against the Nats, which I think we can do and will. And and there's there a, a hope for optimism sort of springs back in um, before exactly what you just said. <laughs> we face all those teams. All right, Curtis, how about you? Well, it's good that we mailed it in June and July when we faced two teams with winning records over the course of those two months. Um, well, now you guys, it makes, it'll make it more impressive when we go on the run. Exactly. Indeed. Uh, you guys mocked my uh, two and five last week if we had only gone two and five. Um, I'm going one and four. What, what game do we win? Uh, we'll beat Geo. Okay, swept in Seattle. Yeesh. Uh, I'm going to go two and three. We win one game in Seattle, not the King Felix game. And then we'll win Sunday night against Geo. Yeah, and it, it is the ESPN game, Sunday night against Washington. Which is the mark of death. <laughs> I know. All right, guys, that's the show. Everyone, please make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel <laughs> as well as iTunes or Stitcher so that you don't miss any of our weekly shows. And as always, check us out at AtlantaBaseballTalk.com for past shows, to check out our blogs, and to post in our comment section. And be sure you follow us on Twitter at ATL Baseball Talk and to like us on Facebook. Thanks again for listening, everyone, and go Braves! Thanks for listening to Atlanta Baseball Talk, your weekly podcast for all things Atlanta Braves. To find new shows, to post in our forum, or to send a comment, please visit us at atlantabaseballtalk.com. Had to admit-